Hi, I'm Thomas. Welcome back to Pilot's Workshop. So, where were we? In the first video about this coffee grinder restoration, we found out about the problems this device had and started working on them. And there was a lot of sanding. I want to continue where we left off, with the metal components of the grinder. The bean chamber regained some stability and that should keep it from breaking any further in the future. But at this point there were still two problems left with it. The first one was the lid. Many of these small grinders have some type of this sliding lid. However, I did not get how the one from this machine was supposed to work. It would always drop into the middle when I tried to close it. The second problem was somewhat an aesthetic one. With the one guide pushing, developing significant play, the main shaft started touching the edge of the hole on top, which led to both parts cutting into each other. I would like to hide this somehow and prevent the cutting effect from happening again. So I came up with a simple solution that would solve all these things at the same time, while being completely reversible. I wanted to make a hollow screw that covers the hole while letting the shaft pass through. And that screw would go into a round nut that serves as a guide surface for the lid to glide along at. But it's best if I just show you what I mean. First I made that hollow screw. I shaped the head in a way that would make it seem like it belongs to the coffee grinder. The round nut came next. And after parting off, I filed in two flat spots in the bottom area so that I could hold the nut with a standard key. I still had a bit to go here. A good tip for hand filing is to mark flat areas in some way. This way you can easily check where you're taking off material, if your surface gets flat or convex in some kind and it makes changing of the angle very easy, like I'm doing here. Once in place, it worked surprisingly well. The only thing I didn't understand was how exactly the lid was supposed to be moved. I did weeks of research about this and never found an explanation. But some of those lids had little knobs to push them with. I saw this as the only reasonable way to make this work. So I made a tiny knob from stainless steel that would fit. I precision marked the spot where it would go 
and drill the 2mm hole in that position. I tried to avoid these invasive things the best I could, but this seemed to be the only way this time. With a little knob, the action of opening and closing finally worked. This meant that all metal parts were finally ready to receive their finish. And this is another detail that I spent extensive research on. Originally, all metal parts, except the grinders, were nickel plated, with a galvanic, aka electric process. This gave them a chrome-like, shiny finish. But this kind of look requires a spotless surface finish of the base metal. However, because of corrosion, the surface of the bean chamber had become quite rough and polishing it would have meant to remove a big portion of the very thin material. So that wasn't an option. But since I wanted to keep a metal surface, I decided for a different method, called chemical nickel plating, that would create a more matte finish, hiding the imperfections on the surface. In that method, a metal part is put into a nickel solution and gets heated to around 90 degrees Celsius. But I will talk a bit more about this in a minute. To prepare the parts for the process, they first went into a galvanic degreaser to clean the surface. Then, because brass parts need a special treatment, the bean chamber went into a special cleaner for copper alloys that was surprisingly effective. To activate the brass part for the nickel plating, it then went into a palladium solution to enable the nickel to react with its surface, which darkened it a little bit. After that, everything was ready for the nickel solution. The optimal temperature for this process would be between 80 and 90 degrees Celsius. In order to measure this from the outside, I got a laser thermometer. And because the glass has a reflective surface, I taped up an area with masking tape. And to have a slightly greater accuracy in the temperature reading, I made a small black-ish field to compare the reading of a black surface with the reading of a white surface. Since those two colors would emit different amounts of infrared radiation and I didn't know which value the thermometer was calibrated to. In retrospect I must say this was quite overkill since the reaction temperature did not have to be narrowed down to this degree of precision. You can see that I chose to hold up smaller parts with a plastic covered wire. The reason for this is that any metal, especially iron or steel, would attract the nickel once the reaction starts. This is also the reason why I am using a glass container. An enamel pot would have also been fine, but the glass lets me watch the process. I should also mention that I tested this glass cup by boiling water in it first, to make sure it would withstand this procedure and not split or burst from the heat of the stove. The nickel solution was activated with a second liquid. Let's talk a bit more about this now. In a chemical reaction, Nickel, or to be precise, a nickel phosphor alloy, bonds to the metal part, creating a robust surface layer. According to what I read, the resolving layer is harder and more durable than traditional galvanic nickel plating. Which was the main reason why I chose this method. Because this meant that the chance of any nickel rubbing off was minimized, preventing further corrosion in the future. After all of the nickel in the solution had bonded to a metal part, the liquid turned clear and I took everything out, rinsed it off and let it dry in the sun. The only old metal part that didn't require any plating was the batch, since it was made from tin or zinc. So I gave it a mild polish, making sure that none of the very fine details got lost. This leaves us with the wooden body of the grinder. If you remember, we took care of any larger damages in the first video of this project and found out about major woodworm damage. So the first job now was to fill those in some way. For this I again chose epoxy, as it wouldn't just fill the holes, but also hardens to a homogeneous combination with the wood itself, even stabilizing it locally. Filling the small worm holes worked great this way too, as the capillary effect sucked the resin deep into the worm channels. Just look at this spot, that I had to add some resin to a couple of times.
After the glue had cured once again, the process of sanding continued. And after repeating this procedure two or three times, the wooden parts were finally prepared and I could test fit the box. I replaced the various old screws with new ones that looked exactly the same. The bottom was originally joined with nails, but I don't like nails and decided to join them in a more reversible way, using the same screws as for the top. So it was time to carefully prepare those, making sure that I would drill in the right places. The final two wooden parts that still had to be prepared for refinishing were the wooden knobs. Let's take a look at the crank knob. Originally it was mounted with a rivet that it was spinning on. This had the disadvantage of wearing down the wood when grinding coffee, combined with an awful squeaking and making it impossible to take apart and clean without damaging something. So I decided for the fanciest way I could come up with at this small scale. I opened up the hole to allow for a brass tube to be glued in, which could work as a bushing that a bolt could run on. But this will become clear later. First I also cleaned up the tiny knob of the little drawer. Then all the wood was ready for the finish. To further prepare the surface of all parts, I went over everything with a wet cloth and let it dry again. This caused open wood fibers to raise up, which made the surface rough again. Those fibers can be gently sanded off with fresh sandpaper, and the process repeated. After every time those fibers get shorter and the surface smoother. This step was important for me, because I wanted to use water-based finishes. The decision about the finish was by far the hardest one to make in this project. On the one hand side I wanted it to look as close to its original appearance as possible. On the other hand side I wanted the coffee grinder to feel solid and sturdy, like when it was new. At this point all damages and defects, like dark spots or wormholes, jump right into your eye when you look at the wooden box. Which makes it appear very brittle and fragile, even though it isn't anymore. So I chose a dark, almost mahogany-like color to stain it. This would not make the damages invisible, but gently hide them from the eye. All sign of the coffee grinder's long history are still there and showing. You just have to want to look a bit closer to discover them. And of course the coffee grinder should be fully usable from a modern point of view. To seal the surface I used a clear, semi-gloss acrylic lacquer. And to completely protect all parts from moisture, I painted every surface, inside and out. Since the lacquer would now come in direct contact with the ground coffee powder, I chose one that stated to be safe for the use on baby toys, aka safe to be chewed on. In addition to that, it is alcohol and sweat resistant, so it can be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected if wanted. After the first layer had dried, the surface was still not perfect and so I took 400 grit sandpaper and carefully sanded it smooth but not so much that I would get down to the finish. Then another layer of lacquer, more sanding, another layer and so on. Up to five times in some places until I was happy with the surface.
Then the knob was the last unfinished part. So I went ahead and cut off the excess brass tube and filed it flat. Leaving it a tiny bit proud of the bottom as a surface for the knob to sit and spin on. And after cleaning the inside of the tube from residue epoxy, I finally made the long promised screw for the knob to sit on. And here we are, ready for the assembly. A mixture of old and new parts. Any lubrication or oiling was done with a food safe and biodegradable oil.
I must say, this was an incredible journey. This little shabby coffee grinder really grew on me. It still shows that it is nearly 90 years old. At the same time, it is more than just a museum piece. Ready to be used. Let's see how it works. A final touch up with little rubber feet to keep it from scratching anything or slipping and to raise it up a bit so moisture cannot be trapped underneath. Rice was the first thing to be ground in it after the restoration. This is a classic method to clean grinders. Then it was time for it to grind actual coffee beans again. The first time in decades, I suppose. I think this is a good time to mention that these small coffee grinders are usually meant to hold in your lap when grinding coffee. This is Pilot's Workshop, thank you for watching.